Picture this, if you will. You're a plastic surgeon specializing in breast reconstruction who receives a new referral in clinic. The patient is a 58-year-old female, recently status post unilateral mastectomy, who had a tissue expander for a breast implant placed at the time of her original mastectomy. While the original plan had been to place a breast implant, the skin of the chest wall has been severely damaged by radiation therapy, and you don't think that the skin of the chest wall will survive further expansion of the tissue expander, much less the placement of a permanent implant. Given your expertise in microsurgery, you discuss breast reconstruction with a transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap, or a tram flap. You explain to the patient that the surgery harvests a portion of the abdominal wall and rectus abdominis muscle attached to the blood vessels that supply it. If the blood vessels are carefully identified and preserved, you say to her, then they can be disconnected and reconnected to major blood vessels in the patient's chest, allowing the flap to survive despite the radiation damage. She expresses amazement that, as a breast surgeon, you have such a detailed understanding of the anatomy of the abdominal wall. Welcome to another section on gastrointestinal anatomy. Today, we're going to go over a primer of the body wall. As with any anatomy section, it helps to go in with a purpose, rather than just try to memorize names on a diagram. So, by the end of this section, I want you to be able to 1. Identify the origin and insertion of the rectus abdominis and inguinal ligament. 2. Identify three major structures in the femoral triangle and describe the route they take from the abdomen to the thigh. 3. Name three muscles of the lateral abdominal wall from deep to superficial. Then, describe their common insertion in the rectus sheath and how this relates to the term arcuate line. Finally, describe how the lateral abdominal muscles form the inguinal canal and identify the contents of said inguinal canal. So despite being the bread and butter of most surgeons, the abdominal wall can be a confusing place if you're just starting out. The abdominal wall proper consists of everything outside the peritoneum, a thin bit of membrane that surrounds the abdominal organs. The transversalis fascia is a pretty flimsy bit of fascia that lies directly on top of the peritoneum, and after that is when things start to get a little weird. Most of the rest of the structures are centered around the rectus abdominis muscle, which anchors the sternum to the pubic bone in the middle, either that or the inguinal ligament, which stretches from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic bone. Now the latter is anchored firmly at its attachment to the ASIS, and even reinforced at the pubic bone with a secondary ligament called the lacunar ligament. But the entire middle portion floats above the iliopsoas muscle underneath. Now, this creates sort of a tunnel, with the iliopsoas muscle as the floor and the inguinal ligament as the roof, a tunnel through which the femoral nerve, artery, and vein pass through to reach the legs. In the proximal portion of the thigh, between the sartorius, adductor longus, and the inguinal ligament, this major neurovascular bundle runs extremely superficially, basically only covered by skin and fat. Because of that, it's an important access point, not only for surgeons, but also for cardiologists and interventional radiologists who use the femoral artery as an access point to the arterial circulation. It's also used by emergency and critical care physicians who use the femoral vein as central access, and by anesthesiologists who can perform regional nerve blocks to the femoral nerve to help with severe post-operative pain in the leg. Because of its importance, this anatomic region is given its own name, the femoral triangle. Now, let's turn our attention to the rectus abdominis muscle for a moment. Superiorly, the rectus abdominis muscle is surrounded in front and back by a layer of connective tissue called the rectus sheath. Inferiorly, however, the rectus sheath only covers the rectus abdominis superficially, rather than wrapping all the way around it. And the cutoff point where the deep part of the rectus sheath ends is called the arcuate line, named obviously for its arc shape. Now the most important anatomic relationship to remember is with the inferior epigastric vessels, which arise from the external iliacs just before they cross under the inguinal ligament to become the femoral vessels. They penetrate the transversalis fascia and run inferior to the arcuate line and penetrate the rectus abdominis sheath. Now because these two vessels supply both the muscle and the superficial skin and fat through perforator vessels, a successful free tram flap relies on the ability to dissect out the inferior epigastrics and reanastomose them to the internal thoracic vessels in the chest wall. The inferior epigastric vessels also have another important anatomical relationship, which we'll get to in a moment. Now the three lateral muscles of the abdomen, the transversus abdominis, internal oblique, and external oblique from inside to outside, are strongly associated with both the rectus abdominis muscle and the inguinal ligament. More than that, they help form the inguinal canal, a piece of work complex enough to where it deserves its own section in GI anatomy. But the short version is, because the testes start in the abdomen and then move out to the scrotum in fetal development, they end up punching holes in a lot of the lateral abdominal musculature and fascia on their way out, holes that are very relevant to the surgical anatomy of inguinal hernia repairs. The first hole is in the transversalis fascia, 
the transversus abdominis and internal oblique muscle wrap around, and their aponeuroses merge in the middle to form the rectus sheath. Now, because of how the transversus is shaped, it doesn't need a hole punched in it, but the internal oblique does. So does the external oblique, which wraps around to form a distinct aponeurotic layer that makes up the most superficial part of the rectus sheath. And all three holes are connected by a tunnel that leads directly to the scrotum called the inguinal canal. Now, this varies depending on how far along the inguinal canal you are, but in general, the canal is surrounded by fascia and cremaster muscle that you can read a little bit more about in the inguinal region section for a better explanation. The main structural support, though, comes from the inguinal ligament that serves as the floor of the inguinal canal, and the external oblique aponeurosis that forms a sling anteriorly as it merges into the inguinal ligament. The much flimsier transversalis fascia provides the posterior support. The inguinal canal contains the spermatic artery and vein and the vas deferens, which you can recognize on account I drew a sperm in it. There's also the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, which, true story, is the only one of all of these that's relevant to women. Yep, even females have an inguinal canal, but since it obviously doesn't contain a spermatic cord, a lot of people wonder what it even does. Well, wonder no further. The genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve provides sensation to the labia, which are, and this is true, homologous to the scrotum. That fact never ceases to amaze me. Now the first hole in the body wall is called the deep inguinal ring, and the last one in the external oblique is called the superficial inguinal ring. Now there's a whole section on hernias, but the clinical significance is this. When it comes to inguinal hernias, the logical path for hernias to follow seems like it would be to follow the natural tunnel in the inguinal canal, with the bowel poking through the superficial inguinal ring into the scrotum. And this is the most common way for inguinal hernias to occur. But the abdominal wall also has a natural weak spot in the region bordered by the rectus abdominis, inguinal ligament, and inferior epigastric vessels called Hesselbach's triangle, where hernias can push out directly towards the superficial ring. Since it pushes directly through to the superficial ring, the hernias emerging in Hesselbach's triangle medial to the inferior epigastrics are called direct inguinal hernias, whereas the ones that go through the deep ring along the more tortuous inguinal canal are called indirect inguinal hernias and these emerge lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. Again, for more on that, check out the specific section on the inguinal region and the section on hernias. But for now, it's time for a flash quiz. Your question is, what is the name of the anatomic structure above which the rectus abdominis is completely surrounded by fascia? The answer is the arcuate line. Superior to the arcuate line, the rectus sheath has an anterior and a posterior component, but inferior to the arcuate line, there's only an anterior component. And that about covers it. Anatomy subjects are always kind of a jumble of terminology, but at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. The external and internal obliques form a common aponeurosis in the anterior midline that surrounds the rectus abdominis superior to the arcuate line and passes anterior to the rectus abdominis inferior to the arcuate line. The femoral nerve, artery, and vein pass deep to the inguinal ligament to get from the pelvis to the femoral triangle of the thigh. The genital branch of the general femoral nerve and the vas deferens and spermatic artery and vein pass through three holes, quote-unquote, in the abdominal wall on their way through the inguinal canal. And finally, the inferior epigastric artery and vein arise from the external iliac artery and vein and ascend superiorly along the arcuate line to the rectus abdominis. They help distinguish direct inguinal hernias, which arise medial, from the indirect inguinal hernias, which arise lateral to the inferior epigastrics. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. If you like this video, go ahead and give me a thumbs up down below, and as always, comments are more than welcome. Arjun Iyer, signing out.